Hey everybody! Today's practice problem comes from Principles of Microeconomics by N. Gregory Mankiw. We're going to be doing, in the sixth edition, as usual, chapter nine, problem number one. Our problem starts as follows. It says Mexico represents a small part of the world orange market. And then part A says draw a diagram depicting the equilibrium in the Mexican orange market without international trade. Identify the equilibrium price, equilibrium quantity, consumer surplus, and producer surplus. And then part B says suppose that the world orange price is below the Mexican price before trade and that the Mexican orange market is now open to trade and then asks us to do the same sort of analysis. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to switch this up a little bit rather than literally do the parts in order what is actually more helpful so that we can do this all in the same diagram is to have one supply and demand diagram that shows the equilibrium outcomes with and without trade and then to label things so we can all in one fell swoop do our consumer surplus and producer surplus. So let's think about how to do that. So the beginning of this is pretty easy, right? That we're just doing the same thing that we've been doing for a while now. So we can start drawing our orange market. Again, we just want to have market quantity on the horizontal axis, so big Q here. And then market price on the vertical axis. And now, when we draw a demand curve, we want to be more specific. And we want to say this is specifically the demand from domestic consumers or consumers within the economy that we're looking at. So I could call this D sub DOM for domestic. And similarly, I could have a supply curve that looks like the normal supply curve that we've had this whole time. And what this supply curve is, is actually the supply curve for domestic producers. So this answers the question of how much producers, again, within the economy that we're considering, are actually producing. And we can call this S sub DOM for domestic. And what we'll notice, of course, if there's no trade, and we're in a situation that economically is referred to as autarky, so not trading with anybody, that again, our equilibrium price and quantity is just what we had before. It's just at the intersection of domestic supply and domestic demand. So, of course, this is our Q star. This time I'll call it Q star sub NT for no trade. And we're going to have a market equilibrium price as well. Call that P star sub NT, again, for no trade. So this is our starting point that we can say, well, how does this change once we introduce international trade into the picture? So let's think about the information that we want to incorporate into our diagram when we start trading with other countries. It says, suppose that the world orange price is below the Mexican price before trade. So this is going to be the price before trade. And so we know that the world price of oranges is going to be somewhere below that. And we also know from the beginning of the question, it says, Mexico represents a small part of the world orange market. So we can make what's called the small country assumption. And we can say, to simplify our trade analysis a little bit, let's just assume that Mexico can get as many oranges as it wants on the world market at the going world price, that it doesn't have to worry about its demand actually pushing up the price in the world market because it's small compared to the overall market. And when we make that small country assumption, we can say, actually, we're just going to have a horizontal line here at the world price. So th call this WP for world price. And that we can buy as much as we want at that world price. So if we were to think about what this line actually represents, it actually represents a supply of imported goods. So if I really wanted to, I could call this S sub IMP for imports. Or I could just notice, hey, this is just the world price that I just take this as given. You don't have to totally worry about this here, but it's helpful to recognize what this actually represents. Now the problem asks us to identify a number of quantities here. It says, identify the new equilibrium price. Okay. So what we can notice here, just intuitively, 
we can say, well, if this country, if Mexico, can get as many oranges as it wants on the world market, it's not going to be willing to pay more than the world price for oranges because it can get as many as it wants at that price. So what's actually going to happen is that we're going to have this world price as our equilibrium price under free trade. Because we say, oh, well, if the price is below the world price, we have a shortage because we have only domestic production and that's not enough to satisfy domestic demand. So the price gets bid up as we relieve that shortage. But once we get to this price here, we realize, oh, hey, wait a minute, we can actually satisfy all of this demand, not necessarily with domestic production, but by buying on the world market. So if we can get imports at the world price, our equilibrium is going to end up being at that price as long as that price is lower than the price that would have occurred with no trade. So we can label this here, call this P star sub FT for free trade. And then we can say, well, huh, if this is going to be our equilibrium price under free trade, how much is actually going to be transacted? Well, that's just going to you know, be answered by the question, well, how much do domestic consumers demand at that world price? And that's this quantity here that we can call this Q star sub FT, right? So this also asks us identify the new equilibrium price. We did that quantity consumed. Well, that's just the quantity transacted here, right? Then it says quantity produced domestically. Well, we can check this out. And if we make the, the not particularly strict assumption that we're going to at least try to buy domestically before we start importing stuff, as long as we can do so at the same price, then we can say, well, at this price, at this world price, the amount that's supplied domestically is going to be this quantity here. So we can say, actually, call this Q sub S for the quantity that's being supplied domestically. We can have this much from domestic production. And then we'll notice that, of course, the difference between how much domestic producers are producing and how much is actually ultimately consumed has to be made up with by exports. Sorry, it's got to be made up for by imports. Um, just in case it was not clear, exports are when you're selling to other countries, imports are when you're buying from other countries. Not sure why I was thinking that. But anyway, this difference, if we're buying on the world market, we're importing stuff. So you can think about this horizontal distance here as the quantity of goods that are imported. If you wanted to numerically calculate this, this would just be our equilibrium quantity under free trade minus the amount that domestic producers are actually producing. Another way that you could think about this if you wanted to is to rather than think about these two supply curves, the world supply or the supply of imports and the domestic supply separately, we could actually construct a total supply curve that would just be the sum of the domestic production and the imported production. And if we were to do that, we would see at prices below the world price, we'd only have domestic supply. So our total supply would just be the same as domestic supply here. So you'd have something like this. But then once we hit the world price, we basically had for all practical purposes, unlimited supply. So if we were to construct the rest of this total supply curve, then we would be taking this part here, right? So we could think about this blue part as, I'll call this S sub TOT for total, right? And if we were to think about our supply curve in this way, you would notice that now our analysis just simplifies to our regular supply and demand analysis that we would say, well, if our supply curve looks like this and our demand curve looks like this, then our market equilibrium is just at the intersection of supply and demand, which is, of course, here, which is, in fact, what we found when we were thinking about it the other way. So it doesn't actually change the outcome, just provides a sort of a little bit cleaner way of thinking about it and shows how this isn't really a big change compared to the supply and demand analysis that we've already done.
now that we've figured out what our market outcomes look like under no trade and under free trade, we can come back to this question of consumer surplus, producer surplus, total surplus, and so on and so forth. So to do that, the easiest thing to do is to draw our welfare table and we can think about what we need to keep track of. When we have no trade and free trade, we don't have any government in intervention. And we're really only concerned with the welfare of domestic producers and consumers. We're in this very simple model, not making it our business to care what we're doing to the profitability of the welfare of other countries. So let's just keep our focus on the domestic world for the time being. So we can think about either under no trade or free trade, we really just have producers and consumers. So we just need to keep track of producers, consumers, and total. And then we need to keep track of under no trade, under free trade. And then the changes would be helpful to track as well. So we can do that by having a table that has four columns and four rows, something like this here. And we can just label these. We can say consumer surplus, producer surplus, and we can call this total surplus. Sometimes we call it social surplus, depending on the textbook. Those just both mean the same thing. And then we could say here, here's no trade, here's free trade, and then here's our change in going from no trade to free trade. And that's actually important to define because what you'll notice is that when we've done welfare tables like this before, for example, when we were talking about a tax or a price ceiling or something like that, then we had the free market here and the regulated market here. And we noticed that our surplus was larger in the free market than it was with the regulation. But now what we're going to see is we're actually going from the less good scenario to the more good scenario. So we just put these in a different order. I'm not sure why we do that, but that's kind of the convention. So you want to make sure when you're calculating these changes that you're clear in what direction we're switching from and to to be able to properly interpret those changes. So anyway, here again, we can label our different areas with letters so that we can then just refer to those letters as the areas to put in our table, right? So here it's pretty easy that I should be able to get by with just labeling A, B, C, D, and E, like this here. Again, just using the prices and quantities that I've identified as my guidelines for how to define the areas, right? So we can say here, under no trade, we have consumer surplus, that's everything above the relevant price, so above the no trade price, below the demand curve, to the left of the no trade quantity. So consumer surplus is just gonna be A under no trade. So all right, that's fine. Producer surplus under no trade is going to be everything below the relevant price in the market, which is this guy, above the domestic supply curve, because that's what domestic producers care about, to the left of the quantity transacted. So producer surplus in this situation is just gonna be B and C. And then the total surplus is just A plus B plus C. And this shouldn't be surprising because that just looks like the big triangle that we calculated for total surplus you know, at every stage up until this point. So the more interesting part now is when we introduce free trade. But we can apply those same rules and you can apply them very mechanically. There's no ambiguity. So we can say now consumer surplus under free trade is everything above the relevant price, which is now this world price. So everything above here, below the demand curve, and to the left of the quantity transacted, which is now the free trade quantity. So we can say that consumer surplus under free trade is A, B, D, and E. So we can put that here. A plus B plus D plus E. Now for producer surplus, again, we can apply our rules very literally. There's just one sort of caveat that you want to keep in mind. 
say producer surplus is everything below the relevant price, above the supply curve, to the left of the quantity that's actually being produced domestically, right? Because domestic producers can't get surplus on units that they themselves aren't selling. So if we were to think about our third boundary, it would be this quantity supplied here, right? So you would see that under free trade, domestic producers would just be getting area C. So you could put that here. And if we were to add these together, our total surplus under free trade would be A plus B plus C plus D plus E. And if we were to consider these changes explicitly, we would notice that the change in going from no trade to free trade for consumers is just B plus D plus E. And if that's not clear why that is, it's just this minus this. The change for producers when we're opening up to free trade and importing is negative B. Again, just this minus this. And the change in total surplus in going from no trade to free trade is D plus E. So the way that we can think about this, and one helpful way to think about this concept of deadweight loss that we talk about, we say that deadweight loss is the reduction in social surplus or total surplus compared to what's best, compared to what's optimal. And in this case, our free trade situation is in fact optimal. So there's deadweight loss, but there's deadweight loss associated with this no trade scenario. And that deadweight loss is what we're missing out on being here rather than here. So our deadweight loss, we can think about, does in fact exist, but it exists in relation to this no trade scenario and it's in the amount D plus E. The free trade scenario is what was actually socially optimal, so the deadweight loss associated with that scenario is just zero. So let's come back to the problem and make sure that we've answered everything that's being asked. So part A just asks us for the, the market outcome and then for consumer surplus and producer surplus, which is what we did here. And then part B starts talking about free trade and it says new equilibrium price, we did that. Quantity consumed, we did that. Quantity produced domestically. Quantity imported, we're good at that. And this shows the change in the surplus of domestic consumers and producers. So that's just here. And what you'll notice is that when we open up to free trade in markets where free trade makes us want to import rather than export, exporting is a different animal and we'll go through that eventually also. When we open up and we want to import because the world price is lower than the no trade price here, that's when we're going to want to import. What we see is that consumers are made better off with free trade. Producers are made worse off with free trade. But the gains to consumers are larger than the losses to producers. So overall, what we see is we see an overall win or we see an overall increase in total surplus when we open up this market to free trade.